All right, welcome everybody. I hope you are enjoying your intern orientation boot camp. Um, now we're gonna start talking about the real business, the physics of ultrasound. So uh, yeah, bear with me, we have a lot of information. We're gonna try and go through it quickly, but just to kind of make sense of, uh, of what ultrasound really is. So one, one thing I like to think of when I think of what ult how, how ultrasound works, I like to think of dolphins and porpoises and some of our other underwater friends who use echolocation for hunting and for orientation while they're uh, underwater and can't use, and, and can't use vision. So by sending out the high frequency sound known as ultrasound, dolphins can then use the echoes that return. Uh, they can interpret what type of object and uh, the sound beam has hit and, and what, what distance they might be from that object. And this is pretty much the same foundation that we use in ultrasound medicine to identify structures. Of course, we have a, an ultrasound probe um, and a computer, which is a lot more complicated, but does pretty much the same thing. So when basically we have piezoelectric material within these, uh, or crystals within these probes, and when electric current is applied to these piezoelectric crystals, uh, they vibrate. And the vibrations then um, produce sound waves that travel outward away from the probe. As these waves travel through and bounce off of structures, uh, some of these waves will then be transmitted back to the crystals. And the same crystals then receive these returning sound waves and, and vibrate, and their vibrations then result in uh, electrical current that's converted into digital images. So pretty much the same thing, just a little more complicated in, in, in how it's done. Um, in ultrasound wavelength, in, in ultrasound, the wavelength refers to the length of one cycle or one complete negative and positive pressure change. And so the frequency is the number of sound wave oscillations per second, and this is measured in Hertz. Uh, to put it in perspective, human hearing, we can detect sound waves in the range of uh, basically 20 hertz or 20 oscillations per second to about 20 uh, kilohertz or 20,000 cycles per second. When we're using ultrasound, these images uh, are generally produced using sound waves in the range of uh, between 1.6 and about 10 megahertz, so 10 million oscillations per second. So much, much, uh, much... Uh, uh, higher frequency. The amplitude is the measurement of, of the height of these ultrasound waves. And so this can be thought of when we're watching the TV as the, as that we're turning up the volume. Uh, so in the ultrasound world, um, we refer to the strength of the ultrasound intensity as echogenicity. And we have a little bit here. We, obviously, when we think of the echogenicity, we're actually thinking uh, of the amplitude or the volume of the wave that's, that is reflected back towards the ultrasound probe. And so this all depends on the characteristics of the structure itself. So echogenic structures will end up, these are very reflective structures that end up sending high amplitude uh, or high volume waves back to the ultrasound. They're gonna, they're gonna appear brighter on the screen. Uh, so on the left here, you have we, we call that a very hyperechoic structure, something like bone, something like uh, a stone, something for high density. Um, whereas on the far right side of the screen, we have structures that allow the sound waves to pass through them and don't reflect back as, 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 as fiercely. Uh, these are often fluid-filled structures, structures like uh, veins, structures like the eyeball, structures like the bladder. Anything that has fluid inside it will end up looking black on the screen, um, and we call that anechoic. Um, and then we have hypoechoic and isoechoic, uh, which are kind of in the middle there. So let's talk a little about attenuation. Um, it's kind of an important concept, and, and, and it, the, 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 whole, uh, the whole thought is, is as sound waves travel through tissues, energy is lost. And this loss of energy, or this loss of the wavelength signal, is what we term attenuation. And this is due to multiple things. It's due to absorption, uh, deflection, and divergence of the sound waves. Um, uh, due to the structure, and, and, and these specific characteristics make up what we call the attenuation coefficient of different tissues. Um, uh, additionally, att attenuation is also affected by the frequency of sound waves, and the, as well as the distance sound waves travel through tissue. So obviously, if, you, um, are, if you're looking at a structure that's deep in, in, 
uh, in the screen, as the sound waves have to travel further through tissues, uh, there's going to be some of that volume or some of that um, some of that intensity is going to be lost due to attenuation. You're not going to have as great an image uh, really far from the transducer. Um, like I said as well, uh, the f higher frequency transducers, so like the linear probe that we'll talk about, um, and higher frequency transducers uh, also have uh, um, also, also make the uh, have less attenuation in the in the in the, the near field, but have significant. They, they have very significant attenuation as they go through further tissues, so um, making it harder to see in those in those f further fields. Gain. This is, I think, the way we can think of this as the attempt to overcome this attenuation uh, through increasing the gain. And this, this really is uh, basically amplifying the signal through post-processing things in the computer of the uh, ultrasound, but can help make the image more visible on the screen. Um, of course, we have to remember that this incre the gain increases both signal and the noise. Or you know, it's not just the 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 signal quality that will be. Um, that will be increased. So it doesn't always make for a better image. It just makes it uh, easier to visualize. It makes it brighter on your screen, for example. Here's an example of, of an image with too little gain, right? We have the, uh, the diaphragm, liver, kidney interface. However, on the left, in the far field, you, ca you can't really make out the structures. They're very dark. By increasing the gain um, with, on, on the same structures on the right, you can, you, you can definitely make out the structures better um, and visualize them better on the screen. Here's the opposite. When we have too much gain, um, these are vascular uh, structures in, in, a, in like a transverse section. And with too much gain, you can't actually uh, visualize the internal lumen, that, that typically uh, hypoechoic nature that should be in any vascular structure. So turning down the gain gives you, uh, again, a more appropriate image here. The depth is something we should also take a look at every time we're looking at any image. You should adjust the depth uh, so that the image you're looking at is in the center of the screen and optimize the image detail of the structure of interest. So uh, I, I always say try to use the minimal amount of depth necessary to capture the entire, uh, entire structure you want to look at um, so that you can then see it more uh, clearly. Here's an Here's an example of too much depth or excess depth. So obviously these two vascular structures are probably what we're looking at on the top of the screen here, but we have a lot of wasted space below that, um, which makes which not only makes it you know your eye wander on the page, but also makes it uh, less visible to to see the surrounding structures that you're looking at at the top. Here's a picture of a more the same picture but with a more appropriate depth. Um, this is also helpful if you're doing procedures because then you can see the needle or see what you're doing with, with more precision if you, if you get rid of that excess depth. Quickly to go through a few of the modes, the ultrasound modes. These are preset into the ultrasound itself. Um, and the first one we'll talk about is B mode. I like to, I like to it, it, it stands for brightness mode, but I like to think of it as the basic mode. It's the mode, it's a 2D mode where you'll see um, just just different shades of gray uh, and black and and white on the screen. I think it. I call it the basic mode because in any of the other modes, if you're trying to get out of that mode or or get back to where you can see everything on the screen, just push the big B, which it stands for uh, like I say, brightness mode, but brings you back to that uh, mode where you can just see everything in real time. On that note, we have M mode, which is which stands for motion mode. This is a really cool mode because um, as, if, as, if you look on the screen on these two images, you see a white line trajecting through the image. And uh, as you put that cursor along a single line within any 2D image, uh, this mode only assesses the movement of tissues along that single line and they, it, it analyzes it over time. So any movement of structures, including changes of cavity size and movements of structures along that line, uh, can be analyzed. Some of the common clinical applications include the presence or absence of pleural sliding when you're assessing for a possible pneumothorax, um, or assessing cardiac motion and fetal heart rates, which you see on the, on the upper screen there. Uh, additionally, changes in the diameter of the inferior vena cava during respiration and changes of, of cardiac chambers are all good applications of this, so a very good mode that you should get comfortable with. Additionally, 
Doppler, I think, is the other really cool thing that, that uh, ultrasound machines can do. Uh, the Doppler effect, just thinking about, thinking about it back to our, our, our general physics days, the Doppler effect is the change in the frequency or the speed of sound waves due to the uh, relative motion between uh, the, the, what you, the observer and what you're looking at. So, of course, taking a train, the, sound, the wavelength frequency is much higher as it's, as it's approaching you and, uh, and, much, uh, and much larger as you're going away. So in the end, that changes the sound, and, and, and in, when you with, with ultrasound, you are actually able to then um, uh, judge velocities of flows of different structures and different and, and vascular structures and other structures within the body. So a couple of different types of um, Doppler. Spectral Doppler allow, is, is, allows for the, the wavelength changes or tissue velocity changes to be plotted over time at a specific location. In this top screen, you see the cursor, um, or on the left, you see the, the cursor in the top portion uh, is in the middle of an artery. And that cursor is basically assessing the change in velocity of the blood flow as the heart beats. Uh, in real time on the bottom of the screen, you can then watch the change in velocity as, as the tall peaks that you see in the image over time. Venous flow uh, demonstrates a more continuous band-like shape, whereas arterial flow, as you see here, shows a sharper peak and, and a more triangular flow. Color Doppler, that relies on the same principles as spectral Doppler. However, it's not graphed over time. It looks more at the velocity changes on a specific window. You see the, the outline of that yellow window in the middle of that screen. And uh, Color Doppler gives you a colored depiction of the flow direction within that window. So it can, help, it can help you identify vascular structures from non-vascular structures uh, and help assess the direction of the flow. Although it is important to note that the red and the blue colors don't, don't necessarily correspond to arterial or venous uh, flow, but, but, but the red re re respond, uh, or corresponds to flow that's going towards the probe and blue uh, for flow that's going away from the probe. So it's just important to remember that they don't always mean venous or vascular, or venous or, or arterial. Power Doppler is the last one I wanted to talk about really quickly. Um, Power Doppler is different as it, it does not examine the velocity or the direction of the flow. Um, it actually it measures only the amplitudes of the returning frequency shifts. And so it's actually, it, it's actually useful because it can pick up very low flow uh, uh, low flow states. So it's, it's examples would be like testicular or, or very torsion. When you're looking at an already very low flow uh, state, which is the blood flow to the ovary or the, or the testicle, um, this can reliably pick up the flow changes in these already low flow vascular states. So it can be very effective in, in, in specific applications like that. Last but not least, let's talk about a few artifacts. Uh, I think these are just some, some things that we note uh, that are based on physical principles of sound waves that, we, that we'll encounter, but are important because they can, they, they can help us identify certain structures in, that, that are normal or abnormal that we might not be thinking about. Uh, acoustic enhancement. Uh, this is where you might see a bright uh, hyperechoic area on the far side of a fluid-filled structure. In, in this case, we have a renal cyst and you can see how bright it is on the back side of that cyst, but uh, also the bladder, the gallbladder, the eye. Again, pretty much any time you have a fluid-filled structure, the sound waves that travel through them are minimally attenuated, uh, which makes the back of the structure appear brighter when it's, compar when it's uh, compared to the surrounding structures near it. It's a little different. Here's, here's, uh, here we see acoustic shadowing, and you see a gallbladder with a gallstone inside it. Uh, you see the shadow distal to the gallstone, which is kind of that anechoic area below the stone. Um, and you see that basically because the sound waves are unable to pass through the calculus structure. Uh, it's a helpful hint when you're locating and identifying gallstones in the gallbladder as opposed to, say, uh, polyps or other things. It's also helpful to identify ribs and rib spaces and identify the spine shadow when you're looking and uh, doing an, an aorta ultrasound. So, um, so that's acoustic shadowing. And then that is not to be mixed up with edge artifact. So edge artifacts, basically sound waves travel in straight lines. 
So the edge artifact occurs as these waves encounter, encounter a curved structure and then are refracted in different directions. And it leaves an, an acoustically silent or anechoic uh, area that kind of uh, extends out from that side of the, of the, uh, of the structure. Reverberation. Uh, that occurs at tissue interfaces with uh, large acoustic impedance, basically very reflective surfaces, um, uh, which can be like, again, can be bone, it can be pleura, it can be air. These different things cause, uh, these different things cause a lot of reflection. And what happens is that the image is then um, reverberated and, and, and uh, duplicated by the machine. Um, so that you see it multiple times uh, in the in the far field. On the bottom here, you see the, you see what we call a lines, and that's just a, a repeat image of the pleura as it's repeating down. That's not actually a, that's not actually part of the lung tissue. That's just a, re, uh, a, a repeat image of the same uh, pleura a couple centimeters down. This is kind of similar. This is the mirror artifact, and this is the last one we'll talk about. But this occurs when an object is in front of a very very strong reflector. And the strong reflector causes additional sound waves to be bent towards neighboring anatomy. Um, and so the, com the computer falsely interprets this as another anatomic structure on the other side of the reflector. Um, and, and this is commonly seen uh, in this example that we see here, the diaphragmatic pleural interspace. You can see that bright hyperechoic line on the left side of the screen. And this is the diaphragm, which is very reflective. The liver just to the right of the diaphragm is repeated or mirrored in the space to the left of the diaphragm where the lung resides. And instead of lung tissue, you end up seeing a duplicate image of the liver. So that's a normal finding. Whereas if you didn't see that, if you saw some dark or hypoechoic or anechoic structure, there, you might be concerned that you're actually seeing fluid or something else where that airspace typically uh, resides. Uh, you might have some abnormal pathology. So I know we went quick. Uh, we still are over time, so I appreciate you listening. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to getting out there and practicing and looking at some of these, uh, some of this physics in action on our next ultrasound, uh, our next ultrasound um, uh, days. So, anyways, good luck on the on the boot camp, and we'll see you soon. All right, bye.